say that if the strategy is pursued, then by the first quarter of next year, there is no more load shedding in South Africa. Electricity is on. And within five years, South Africa can, from an electricity perspective, aspire to emulate the economic growth rates of the world's most competitive emerging markets. Okay, hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to the uh, United States listeners. Uh, I'm speaking against today to Dr. Franz Cornier. Yesterday we spoke about load shedding and as it uh, turns out, uh, France has load shedding as well. I ran out, my Wi-Fi crashed, everything in this neighborhood was out for a mere 30 minutes. It was a horror show. But so uh, welcome back, France. Yes, hello. Nice to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> um, a question for you. Let's start quickly on the load shedding to give a recap of yesterday. So what we spoke about, uh, correct me where I'm wrong, is South Africa needs about 4 gigawatts to have the lights on. Yeah. And we said between 11, I had 11 to 15. I think you had 18, you had a little bit higher. No, I, I, had, I had 12 to 15. Okay, 12 to 15. 11 okay. to 15. And that was done totally independently of each other. Yes, that's, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. So we came to that conclusion, South Africa needs that. And um, can you maybe just give us a recap? How do you think we should get to, to those numbers for economic growth? Well, the easiest way to get there is to use um, defunct coal. Uh, they 45 gigawatts of coal potential, um, of which only a third, just more than a third, is operational. And the view of, of people who have experience of those plants um, is that they can relatively easily be refurbished. And the way to refurbish them is you send in a team of kind of auditing engineers. They go and look at the plan and the and the workings they see inside those plants and they strip out parts that have failed or corroded or and order replacements and put them in and you're up and running. You know, we, we thought within three years relatively easily and relatively cheaply. Uh, the advantage of that is those plants lie where the grid lies. Uh, there's significant underutilized grid capacity running from north to south through the country. If you want to go and build solar in the West, for example, there is zero surplus grid. You need to build a, a grid before you get going with electricity. So that's the way to do it, and it's relatively straightforward, and it's, it's very encouraging that um, South Africa's electricity minister um, is pursuing this um, strategy now. It's, it's very good. It's, uh, it's for, for a... a party, the ruling African National Congress and the government that have made few shrewd policy decisions over the last 15 years. This is one that ranks up with the best of them. And um, mm. it's, it's quite something to see how the government and the minister get pilloried in, in the press and by civil society and by business leaders for for doing this um yeah but it's absolutely the right thing there's when we worked on this too we actually had had occasion to speak to some green financier type people and um they said look the way to do this is it can't be a strategy that locks south africa into a coal dependent future um, the way to sell this is this is a strategy to buy South Africa the time to do an orderly transition to cleaner fuel sources. Because right. whatever your opinion on, on climate is, coal is, is dirty. I mean, the sort of particles in the air are not good for people. And I think South Africa, given its history and its place in the world and Africa's broader contribution to emissions, can make a very strong case that um, emerging markets, and South Africa in particular, need to be given the time to do an orderly transition to what, in our opinion, and is more your area, would be a sort of a model of, of, of nuclear and green when and if green storage technologies improve to the point that you can actually capture the surpluses you generate when the wind blows or the sun shines. Well, I, I, I would... Um so yesterday I would 
picture it. First of all, on the call, I'm not entirely agree in agreement that it is as dangerous. You have call, but they're now called clean call. Though Donald Trump misused that word called Eli call in the United States. That cuts emissions, as far as I know, by an 80 90%. And just by upgrading your coal plants to them, you go with the normal coal plants with the rank and the Brayton cycle is 30%. I think South Africa is 20% efficiency. And you can get it easily to 40%. Although with that, there has to be an adjustment which people haven't thought of yet, which is you will have to get a higher quality of coal. Yeah. South Africa historically burned bad coal. It's not the China that we're selling to the Chinese. We've made a decision years yeah. ago to do so so that we can have fly ash for cement. So there will be an adjustment to the supply chain. So there might be a, a more expensive integration. Yeah, also, I mean, the, the, the manner in which some coal mining operations take place in South Africa, you drive around this kind of yeah. eastern highlands of Mpumalanga. I mean, the consequences for maize farmers, for water quality, partly mm -hmm. because I think environmental regulations aren't complied with. Is, yeah. is, and that point, I mean, nuclear is just cleaner, yeah. better. So the transition to nuclear does does the, the point though is that this needs to be a transition from um, over a period of, of twenty or thirty years yeah. to different fuel sources in the interim for our European trade partners. I mean, from from us us now South Africa's European trade partners to threaten to punish the country's exports is absolutely absurd. You know, European and American Africa policy is one of the craziest things at the moment. You, you, it's, you have it's, it's changing in the US, though, I would say. Europe Ch is changing good. a bit, but still, I mean, I, I've just, I've, I've had a few of these discussions here in the last few weeks, and there's sympathy arguments on coal and energy, particularly when you point out the consequences of forcing South Africa in transition. Now, forcing South Africa into a Green transition now traps 20 million people in permanent unemployment yeah. for the rest of their lives. That's the price. Well, I, I called it Malthusian. Um, I wrote an article last yeah, week and right, I said it's it's, 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 it's morally horrific yeah. what um, some Western diplomats and green activists are demanding of and South Africa's people. You, 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 you know, I, I, I just want to point out a few facts on that, which is South Africa produces about, depending on you ask, 1%, 1.5% of the world's CO2 emissions. As per the IPCC's own predictions, if we fall off the ocean tomorrow, it makes no difference in the temperature of the earth, okay? That's the science. <laughs> That's working group one of the IPCC yeah. report. And the COPE conference, the last one said, they explicitly said the poorest people in the world can increase their CO2 emission while the richest nations have to cut. That was that came out of the IPCC, and that seems to be missed by policymakers in Europe at this moment and North America. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the, I mean, the, the centerpiece of both European and American policy are towards Africa now, number one, is Africa must do a green transmission uh, transition, and if it doesn't, we'll will punish its exports. Now, I mean, just, just to, I mean, it's, 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 there's morally, it's horrific, uh, the consequences of that. But, but more than that, just strategically, it's so far gone. I mean, the, 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 the West is losing on Africa. The French have been pushed out of West Africa. Russia's very shrewd choke point diplomacy of using small amounts of money and relatively small numbers of, of security people to take, uh, to position themselves as kind of potential kingmakers in regions. So they did that in Syria, they did it in Libya, doing it in West Africa now. That's very good. China is, um, is long-term Africa strategy is very shrewd. You know, Africa's now got more cities of over a million people than Europe and America combined. And um, China's building a lot of the infrastructure, including the data infrastructure. This is part of, of the build that people don't notice. And the data infrastructure will transmit the ideas and opinions that will shape the views of the African people who will in turn deliver the governments that will in turn um, yeah. collectively own 50 votes on global fora. So if, if you lose 50 votes on, on a globe, on the UN General Assembly question or so on, you, you strategically the setback for you is, is, is considerable. So one of the things I don't understand about a lot of contemporary Western and European, I mean, uh, European and American Africa policy is it makes no sense for Europe and, 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 and America. The U Europeans, whatever they say in public, are, are very worried about the consequences of the flow of migrants into Europe and yeah. the political ramifications. 
If you demand that Africa turns off its cheapest, the most reliable energy sources, <laughs> you're going to get more migrants moving yeah. to Europe. And and, and, um, and, and, and you know, inside the European Union, it's also a problem because of the Eastern European migrants coming to the Western countries. And it's the same so, argument. It, it's, it's, and, and what it is, it's, it's this kind of strange cultural evangelism that... Um, Green ideology, and I'm not a, I'm not, I'm, I, I run my whole South African life on solar power. I'm a great champion of it. I recommend that everyone that's in a position to do that does the same. It's, I mean, I've been liberated by the failures of ESCO. So I'm, 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 I'm a strong enthusiast for it, but I'm also able to see the longer term and the strategic implications. Yeah. But if, if, um, so I'm not a, a, an a anti, solar or at all, quite the contrary. But once your ideas become an almost a, a sort of a religion nearly, sort of cultural evangelism, it's dogmatic. and they override all your own national security considerations and the best interest of the countries that you are uh, trying to build relationships with and win hearts and minds, in, uh, then something's gone terribly wrong. And yeah. that is broadly the case for American and European Africa policy today. So what I um, I always make a point is that there's a, f a few things I want to explain to people also about South Africa. And that is, um, you know, I mentioned to a few, to Jacob Moroja as well, during the apartheid years, okay, South Africa had this total strategy, grand strategy for South Africa. ESCOM and Transnet and all these places were incorporated into that strategy, which essentially was a geopolitical tool to settle conflicts. You had Kabora Basa, you had Lesotho. If Lesotho turns off the water, uh, we see Johannesburg dies and simultaneously South Africa will turn on the lights. It was a policy of nuclear deterrence expanded to electricity and water. Now, this is the, the question I want to throw back at you is, you know, there's also a debate among privatization in South Africa, and I've been trying to kick back against this debate and say I'm actually in favor of nationalization, and that doesn't mean I wear a red beret, okay? It's just to say that I'm not convinced that if you're going to privatize ESCOM in its current status, okay, you're not going to re-provoke these internal geopolitical conflicts. And my argument has been part of the pushback the ANC has seen against the Green Agenda from the bottom has been a move to try and make ESCOM turn ESCOM into a role that is historically didn't play. So I'd like to get your view on that. Yeah, long ago when I ran a South African think tank that was centrist and therefore described in the press as far right wing, we um, worked on ESCOM and we said it should remain a state function. It would be best positioned as a state-owned company. In theory, government should be able to finance projects more cost-effectively than, than, than private investors. There, there is the case in South Africa to subsidize access to electricity for, for very poor people. And it's a very small economy. You know, it's half a percentage point of global GDP. It's a bit less than that now. It's been losing ground a bit. But. So absolutely it works as that. And it's, it's I mean, if, 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 you know, American, European, Africa policy seems nuts. Domestic South African policy is just as crazy because the, the ANC is an interesting organization. It, it would totally agree with what we've just said. It, it, would, it, it would say we are, this is the objective. But, but if you don't appoint the best people to run your institutions, then they become less competitive. And, and if, you, if you really do badly in those appointments, they fail. And like dominoes, they fail one after the other. The, the defense industry in South Africa was world beating. That really needs to be sold now. That's, it's done. The national airline uh, used to be an actual flag, flag carrier airline. It's, it's not there anymore. Railways are, are breaking down. The ports are failing. The electricity question we're talking about already. And uh, this... The, the, this is a consequence of the strategies adopted by a political party, which probably as its central priority in policy, overriding everything else, is, is, is state direction of, is a sort of command economy. And so on both ends you get um, a predecessor of mine who 
who died last year, who's a chap I had very high regard for, in his biography kind of ended at the end of it. He put it best. He said, I spent my whole life countering the absurd things that politicians get up to. And on both sides of the South African spectrum, our Western trade partners, policy totally counterproductive, exacerbated by the South African government's policy, trying to counter that policy, which is just as counterproductive. But, but you see, what, what's interesting about ESCOM is, um, on, on this point, ESCOM in 1998 was put on the road of privatization, but the ANC tried to keep it nationalized under a privatized framework. And then on top of that, they gave the they took the authority of ESCOM to collect money away and gave it to the municipalities. Okay, <laughs> Municipalities didn't pay money back. ESCOM's debt, the municipalities' debt at the moment. So you, they put ESCOM in an impossible situation where I don't even think the best manager would have saved it under that policy framework, you know. Yeah, but look, if, if you, it's it's a, a, a friend of mine who is in, in government and does very well. Um, when I said to him, how is it that you guys do so well? He said, look, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, in government, there's not a lot of competition. You know, you've kind of got a monopoly. You can, the people need your product. There's no really other supplier. You can charge whatever you like as long as it's not stupid. And all that we really have to do is, you know, there are lights on poles. We've got to make sure those are burning. There are roads. We've got to make sure those are fine, no holes in them. We've got to make sure there's not murder and mayhem in the streets. And if you get these very basics right, you'll do well. And I said, well, how, how did you do it? And he said, well, we, we balanced the budget, number one, then we appointed the best people we could find, and then it started going really well. So I think the turnarounds in for some of these state-owned enterprises and, and, and ESCOM in particular is relatively straightforward. You know, appoint capable people whose only role is the provision of the cheapest possible uh, electricity for to the South African economy. And um, don't obstruct them with ulterior objectives. Yeah. Social engineering objectives. I mean, as Eskom was failing, it's a sort of a tragic South African kind of story. As, as uh, I forget the year, 10 years back, as it was clearly failing, Eskom announced that they'd won an award for being the most, I don't know, diverse energy parasites <laughs> in the world. And this was widely celebrated. And that's great. That's great, but but it's not it's it's not more important than being able to supply electricity. Well, it's it, it's so, sort of like it's sort of like the European Union who is now trying to fine France for not uh, respecting green, uh, um, not having enough green ele electricity. You know, that's the the equivalent thing of that. And at the same time, France is zero carbon. You know, so you you find these inconsistencies. Eskom won the BE reward. Okay, that's policy. That's social engineering being imposed onto it. And great, maybe they respected those criteria for all you and I know. But, I, but I the main core business too. is not there. <laughs> I must tell you too. In a small way, but a growing way, the sense of some in the South African government is slowly starting to turn on. The consequence of these terrible failures and the political consequences. I mean, in South Africa, the ruling party will lose a future election. I don't think it loses next year's election. And, and I, I chair a group that polls in very great detail, so we know it. I don't think it loses next year, but it will lose a future election. And the knowledge of its defeat, that South Africa inevitably becomes a coalition society, and an understanding that the centerpiece of the defeat of that party, which was the party that Nelson Mandela brought to power almost 30 years ago, is that the socioeconomic circumstances of the supporters of that party haven't been increasing. And they've been in, in practice stagnating for a decade. And more than ever before, although you don't want to overstate the case, there's an openness to rail privatization, for example. There's at least a discussion around it. And, and 15 years ago, there wouldn't really have been. And there are no restrictions placed on private people such as myself getting off the grid and doing our own energy. And and that's significant because if 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 in, in many if if in many post-colonial African societies at the point of their failure the state 
also obstructed the desperate efforts of 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 individuals to insulate themselves against the consequence of state failure. In South Africa, that doesn't really happen. You can do your own security, you can do your own education. They're threatening to interfere with healthcare now, but that's a fight the healthcare industry can win if they choose to fight yeah. it. So, you, you, there, there's this little part of, of, of one as an analyst who watches South Africa closely that wonders whether, you know, reform moments are so tricky because things need to go horribly wrong and threaten complete failure and collapse in order to create the forces that cause ideologically obstinate, um, uh, evangelically sort of ideological politicians to change direction. Mm. So there's an outside chance that this, I mean, the, the incremental signs of that are there in South Africa, whether it, it, it develops into a full-blown reform movement, I think is unlikely. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic it will. I'm optimistic that policy course already changed. I mean, if you take the qualifications of the Minister of Electricity, he's a civil engineer. He's more qualified than me as a civil engineer. Okay, he's the right man for the job based on qualifications, which is astonishing, you know, for an ANC to position somebody like that. There. And it seems to me, at least, the management in ESCOM. I mean, it remains to be seen what they will doing is getting things done. Okay. Yeah. And right. if yeah. if you start pushing people with technical comp, uh, um, background into those positions, they're quickly going to figure out what's wrong with these things. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I, I look at that, I'm optimistic. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic on South Africa's prospects than I was five or six years ago. So I'm very different yeah. to a lot of the clients or so that I run into. Um, the question here, the specific question is, does, I think South Africa can turn whether the question is, does it take the inflection point of a national coalition government to do the turning? Or is there an outside chance that the current administration gets a big enough fright to, um, to turn and head off even the prospects of, of coalition? That's, that's less likely, I think, but... Um, mm. You know, it's, it's, it, it, I, I said to a, 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 a chap who I do some work for this week that on many of these questions, I've never had it easier talking to South African politicians uh, or government officials in 20 years than now. Um, and the reason for that is the consequences of failure are so glaringly apparent. Well, um, I, I, I found them to be far more pragmatic. So as somebody sitting on the outside, okay, I'm in France, I was approached by advisors from Antashi, I won't name them, okay, to help with energy, give them, just give my view, my five cents. And I know people far more qualified than myself. It's only my 30s, the top executive South Africans in the oil and gas industry, who is now in one way or another advising the government. Okay, whether they listen or not, I don't know. I suspect that they are. I don't think I've even seen it. If you asked me this two years ago, I thought you'd be crazy. So something is happening. I don't know if it was just a shock if it was COVID-19, but there's some acceptance among the ANC that, look, our failure is in deliverance and in policy, and we need to turn that ship around. You know, how it will happen, you know, what you say, is coalition or inside the ANC, you know, it's just for us to speculate on. But I'm optimistic. Yeah, and, and, and if you want the kind of developmental near-command economy that these guys are after... There is no room to appoint B-grade people to run the institutions that that economy must be built around. That's one of the ironies of, of, of ANC kind of socialist dogma is that the harder it presses the dogma, the faster it forces the private sector to usurp the role of the state. So wherever um, dogma has been pressed very hard, um, let's take security and policing, which is run badly. South Africa has high crime rates. You know, when South Africa became a democracy, there were 150,000 or about just over 100,000 sworn police officials, so state security people, and the, the equivalent number of private security people. Today, there are three times as many private security officers and in South Africa's case, these, these aren't people that, that guard the local pharmacy from shoplifters. These are 
serious operators. Three times as many. So the the middle classes and business have short-circuited the state and do their own security. And in poor communities, exactly the same phenomena happens, but through in the form of vigilante action and vigilante killings. And then this is also, I think, a lesson the ANC is slowly starting to learn that, um, you, you know, it's, I, I think it would have loved to have been Lee Kuan Yew, who absolutely have. And, and I think for, for you know, the ANC's recently been sending lots of delegations around the world and the South African government because they got into a bit of trouble around a, a Russian ship that visited our shores. And I think for some of those on those delegations to visit Western capitals now and to compare that to the state of a lot of South Africa's cities, which are crumbling, um, traffic lights not working, vast holes in the roads. I, mean, you could, I, I think that must have the same kind of effect now of, you know, it's, it's the physical degradation of South Africa's infrastructure and cities as a consequence of appointing two government people who simply weren't qualified to do what they needed to do. Yeah. That perhaps, yeah, perhaps, perhaps there is this prospect that under pressure, more pragmatic decisions start being taken. But there's a long way to go before that. Yeah, I, I'm not celebrating it, but I'm I'm optimistic that the narrative is open out. I just want to sort of pivot back to the energy thing. So it, it should open up the nuclear conversation. The ANC has surprisingly been in favor of nuclear. And nuclear industry is an interesting thing in South Africa. The only people opposed to it are the ones who get their lights from nuclear, which are UCT. Okay. Yeah. If you look at the Afrikaans population, they are overwhelmingly in favor of it. Okay, as my sense of it, and of course the Black Union saw, which is a strange coalition of events. You wouldn't have thought of even these other two groups I would have picked in South Africa if I had the choice. Um, my proposal for nuclear and what what others you know are trying to say is that we need water in South Africa. We ran out of water in two thousand and eight. Nuclear is an ideal technology for desalination of seawater because you don't have to go electrical; you can just use the thermal energy. Okay, so it's a much higher capacity. And my proposal has been built around the coast. Um, I believe there's two sites already. Um, they've done the impact assessments, one in Cape Town and one in, I think it's Port Elizabeth, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, just to get your view on that, if that's actually yeah, a yeah, sensible strategy. That's quite right. You know, we've, I'll send you the data. We've polled this. And in South Africa, very rich people are opposed to nuclear and coal, the richest people. And that's because they watched Three Mile Island on Netflix and they thought, end of the world. Um, but poorer people in South Africa are strongly in favor of coal and nuclear. So it's, it's an elite uh, phenomenon, this fear of nuclear. And even people who watch you know, films like Three Mile Island, at the end of it, if you, if you ask them how many people died, they... <laughs> you know, coal mining, people die all the time. It's terribly dangerous. Well, I, I, I mean, there's a policy behind this, which is the linear no threshold model of radiation. It's something all radiation is dangerous. Yeah. And if you actually fix for that thing, uh, um, the cost of nuclear in the United States will be the, the same as the Chinese's. And the reason the Chinese build at one third the rate of the US is because in practice they don't respect that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, so, so um, this. This, these, this is nuclear is exactly the kind of option that South Africa should transition, okay. should should consider to transition towards after the refit of 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 the third of the coal fleet has been completed. Yeah. Um, and the question is only how how is that financed? A lot of South Africa's wealthy elites have said to me it's impossible because it's so expensive; it could never be done. But you, you're the expert on that stuff, and you'll... Yeah, you know, no, the, the, you know the that that nuclear part. plants are expensive in France and the United States. Look, if France were to build it tomorrow, I'd benefit. So I'm saying don't buy French, don't buy American. At the moment, there's three countries, China, Russia, and South Korea. My personal favorite South Africa would be South Korea. Why? Because 150 South Africans build it in Dubai. They want the sites, you can draw that skills back. 
But if the ANC goes for Russia because of geopolitical considerations, I'm not going to oppose it. I think it's naive for them because of the trade relations with America. They underestimate the U.S. influence in South Africa. But be that as it may, I would not oppose the Russians or the Chinese building it as well. You know, they, they're good technologies, whatever you think of those regimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, I, I, I agree with you completely. I think the transition should be to nuclear. And, um, and I'd, I'd put the rider on that. If, as we approach that nuclear horizon, storage technologies around green energy have reached yeah. a point that you can capture the surpluses you're generating and do so cost-effectively, then I think that begins to, to rival it. And, and, and the right sort of diplomatic vision for the South Africans to articulate is to say we're doing our transition to the refit of coal now. That will give us 20 years to aspire to emerging market growth rates and erode the poverty and, and the unemployment, which otherwise risks the political stability of the country. And in the aftermath of that, uh, a sort of set of decisions, we want to aspire to a model of what is clean energy. Now, that's either nuclear or that's, that's, that's green. No. And um, the balance between them determined by the cost of green storage technology. Well, and, and geography, because remember, nuclear, you can, at the current technology, only build around the coast. The pebble bed was an attempt to build it inland. It, we can maybe see what the United States is doing with that technology now, but it's it's still not that's, commercialized. That's fine. Uh, There's more than enough coal to look after. But you can you can use solar and wind in inland anyways, and, and coal. So and the other one is natural gas. Probably need to migrate to the coasts in greater numbers. They only live in the middle of the country because of 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 mining and gold. Yeah. There's no South Africa's coastlines are relatively underpopulated. And if over the next 50 years or 100 years you see a, the, the balance of the population moving onto those coastlines, that would make enormous sense for the country. And, I mean, it, it fits the nuclear model too. So, And, and also the, um, yeah. the other one I want to add here is natural gas. So I looked at feasibility studies that were done by a few people. The logical place to put a gas terminal in South Africa would be Richards Bay, uh, just for uh, an obvious reason. So natural gas, the way it works, South Africa is isolated from the world's supply lines. Um, but Richards Bay is a business case given Transnet's pipeline that you can put in reverse and because there's actually local aluminium smelters. So there's already a market for it, okay, for natural gas. Yeah. So that'll be the ideal place I would put the yeah. gas terminal. Yeah. yeah. No, and we, in, in our advice, we, we said the same, that that you go to gas um, in in you, you go to gas turbines along the coastline where the opportunity to do so arises. But the I mean our, our chief advice was the refitment of coal and then the transition to nuclear and and green over twenty years. And and our chief finding, which we discussed in yesterday's half of this thing, is that it's perfectly reasonable to say that if the strategy is pursued, then by the first quarter of next year, there is no more load shedding in South Africa. Electricity is on. And within five years, South Africa can, from an electricity perspective, aspire to emulate the economic growth rates of the world's most competitive emerging markets. Right. And, and that is um, very good news. And gives you a slightly different take on the likely trajectory of the country compared to the doom mongers who say that we're going to get to, I don't know, stage, I don't know what, stage, stage eight or ten or something over for, for us. And, right. that, and that this is the end of the world and that South Africa is doomed to become a failed state and failed society. And I think. Just, just on the facts of it, from an energy perspective, that's that's wrong, and and that prospect, in fact, only arises if you intentionally blind yourself to the shortcut potential of refitting a third of the defunct coal fleet, or half the defunct coal fleet, a third of the total coal fleet. So it's just the fact that we've been looking away from coal that we can't solve no, this that's issue. That's the only reason for load shedding. The chief, I'm not the only. The, the, I mean, I, I've said in, in the South African press that load shedding is not a consequence of corruption. 
just to make the point, in the main, of course, corruption contributes to load shed. The reason, though, the lights are off is a far too rapid exit from coal, yeah. uh, both in terms of the failure to maintain plant and equipment and in the strategy to do a very rapid transition out, out of coal. So it's both through neglect and through, through intent. And um, uh, uh, this is the load. This this is if you if you're a South African, your lights are out. You, you don't have a job because the economy is not growing. The primary reason is the exit from coal. Secondary reason is the contributing consequences of corruption and the like. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the thing is, corruption is a problem throughout the developing world. My, my wife's Iranian. I can tell you about corruption in that country. They also have load shedding, by the way. The other country with it, and they're building five nuclear plants to rectify it. Um, they just call it rolling blackouts, which is probably a more fitting name for it. Um, but, uh, you know, Egypt, you go to any of these countries, corruption exists throughout the developing world. And I've read works of controversial economists who say that we should not even care about corruption. They're very Machiavellian about it. They say, yes, if you can lock up a few guys, all better. But it's it's not the do end of the world if there's corruption in your system, as long as you have economic growth. <laughs> I don't know what you would say to that. No, no, I think that, I mean, that, that is my advice to people too. I say corruption's baked into the system. So it's not a, a emerging world phenomena either. It's not an African issue. It exists broadly. And corruption's going to remain baked into our political system for the foreseeable future. The only time at which you might turn a real corner on that is at the inflection point of a future coalition government. Then you may... Um, escape that. But that, that's baked in. But there are a lot of societies that are corrupt, and many of them produce much better results. They, they don't all have electricity off half the day. They produce much better education outcomes. They have much higher rates of economic growth, and it's not so not to excuse the corruption or to say that it's, it's unimportant. It's just, do, do you want realistic advice on where in the world you're investing, or or do you want to have a first-year university debate on the merits of liberal democracy? Because if you're trying to commit capital to economies, you need to have the former, a realistic discussion. And if you have that realistic discussion on South Africa, the conclusion, more often than not, is that this is potentially a far more competitive South Africa is a far more competitive uh, investment destination with far stronger upsides than the bulk of the analyst community or mainstream media coverage on the country um, mm. currently suggests. Also, another question I want to add you on this is uh, a question of an Asian tiger economy. Now, there's, there's sort of two paths, as I understand it. I'm not an economist. One is saying that we must do what the United States and Britain do, which is a mercantile trade type of economy. And others have said, well, we should go the Chinese and the um, Japanese route, which is intensive industrial growth, put your money in every industry and use that to solve your unemployment. I mean, do, do you have a way, a uh, view on the path? I forward? think we're far, too, we're far too small to do the latter. And we okay. won't be sufficiently disciplined or competitive in terms of, of labor to do the latter. So I think the, the, the idea of building fortress South Africa and growing it from within is not going to work. You need to have a um, far more mercantile reach. I mean, you, you need aspects of, 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 of the internal, of course. But you need a far more mercantile reach. And, and South Africa and African governments broadly need to learn to trade their geostrategic asset, which is where they're located in the world. South Africa sits in a very important place because on the West Coast is the South Atlantic. South Atlantic hosted the opening naval battles of the First and Second World Wars. And the culmination of those battles determined access to the North Atlantic and who won those wars. To South Africa's east coast is the Indian Ocean Rim. And six sea channels guard access to both the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean Rim. 
if you command any combination of three of those, you can influence, if not dictate, the flow of all naval and commercial shipping traffic um, west of Indonesia, including that around India, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, for 10,000 miles to the east coast of the United States and Europe. One of those access points is the Hormuz Strait. So Iran's got that one. That's not good. If, if you're a Western strategy, you're probably not going to get them on board. Second important one is off the coast of Eritrea, which commands the entrance to Suez. The Eritreans aren't pro-Western at the moment. Um, third one is, is the naval base at Simonstown or arguably Valfus Bay in Namibia. Um, West of that is the Argentinian coast and the southern tip of South America where Xi, the Chinese um, leader, will back Argentina's claim to the Falklands. And the last time that happened, Thatcher was in charge and sent the largest battle group assembled since the end of the Second World War to liberate the Falklands. I don't think the Royal Navy is capable of doing that again. So you can lose Argentina. And then you've got the, the strait between Singapore and Indonesia, yeah. all the way on the east. The, the, the point is that for Southern African governments, particularly those that South Africa and Namibia that have Africa's west coast, you know, if, if, if China develops a naval facility on Africa's west coast, uh, somewhere like Bata, which is an equatorial Guinea, we're attempting to do that. And it develops a serious facility. The Chinese Navy is closer to New York than if it had a base in Hawaii. And it's sailing in the Atlantic. I mean, that's that's mm. not where, you know. That's, that's, that's not going to make the Americans very happy. You know? No. It's very so For very small economies, such as South Africa and, and a minuscule, relatively Namibia, which mm -hmm. I spend a bit of time in and, and think should be far higher up the strategic agenda of, people who think about geostrategic things. Trading your strategic importance in exchange for uh, trade and other related concessions and infrastructure support is, is a shortcut to success. Mm. Um, and if you momentarily go back to American and European Africa policy, which is broadly hostile. Um, I mean, it threatens the Europeans openly threaten South Africa's exports with with this in 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 play, and and Russia and China marching across the continent. It, it really is. I mean, you, you do sometimes think this can't. I mean, the people are yeah, coming I, from I, stuff. I, I, I don't think they learn geography. They, they learn geography anymore in schools because if they very, had very. Hard to see. So, so I mean, the the your your questions here started with you know what what sort of growth model is pursued. The internal economies are too small to build fortress South Africa. Right. A far more external looking growth model is um, desirable, and the prospects for the success of that rise markedly if you learn to trade your geostrategic influence properly, which mm. the South African government does not do because it doesn't understand it. Well, the, the interesting one to me is that the foreign policy, and Lady Pandor, in my view, had the right answer on paper where she said we are non-aligned, but that non-alignment never leaves the foreign office, okay, the foreign affairs. It should reflect in trade policy. It should reflect in energy policy, in my view. I would, for example, build one different reactor from each great power, okay, so they lock them into negotiation. And that's what India did strategically with Nero, because when India was a much poorer country, they realized they couldn't take out any country. So they had a, a military relationship with the United States and a trade relationship with China. And South Africa should look at something similar, try and lock these guys into negotiations so they can't dictate terms to you. Because at the moment, our response to the EU is not to tell the Chinese, come and build a military base here, 
or whatever you want to do, you know. Mm. Our response is just, okay, we're going to try and plead for special, for yeah, special then, pleading. What, what you raise here is true of South Africa's Foreign Affairs Ministry. And the reason for it is something we've already discussed, is that if you don't send the best people to your missions around the world and to populate your uh, foreign desks back in Pretoria, then you lose the ability to do this. And then you lose your global standing. And then you send multiple delegations around the world to kind of try and explain your position. And I don't, I don't know, maybe your listeners say I'm naive. But you know, I've, been, I've been at this for a while. I don't think the South African government is as narrowly pro-Russian as what the as what it creates the impression of and what the local business community in South Africa and some foreign offices and the mainstream media suggests. I, I think it's just incompetent and that what it's trying to do, I mean, I've, I, I actually sent a note at one point and said, listen, just let me, what are you trying to do here? And the note that comes back is, we want the freedom to choose who we associate with on terms that we are comfortable with. And we're very uncomfortable with it being dictated to us from Washington or Brussels that you will have the following relationship with the following actors. I think that's perfectly reasonable from the South African government's perspective. And I, I don't think the South African government is fundamentally anti-Western. I think it values its relationships with um, trade with Europe and with America and, and Goa, in, in, in the specific case of America. And it wishes to preserve these relationships, and it would regret it if, it, if these relationships were compromised. But it equally wishes the, to have the freedom to associate with Russia on terms that it is comfortable with. And you can debate that. And you can say, is that? But it's, it's ambassadors around the world and the Foreign Affairs Department cannot articulate this argument in the spoken form or in an 800-word opinion article in the Wall Street Journal. And what happens as a consequence is other people begin to explain what the South African government's policy is. Yeah. And it loses as a consequence. And it's, it's, it's perhaps one of the best contemporary examples of how, well, almost now decades, of appointing B-grade people to critical positions compromises the ability yeah. of that government to um, to uh, um, but, but, but meet we its see, strategic we, objectives. But we see it this across... It would have a much better yeah. time, a much easier time, if it had um, appointed the best possible people to the Foreign Affairs Ministry. Yeah, but you see this, we get back to, you know, whether it's energy, whether it's water, whether it's foreign policy, it's, it's about competency and consistency in policy that, as you said, they cannot even articulate their own policy. And I mean, I, mean, I spoke to Jacob Morocco, the, the former CEO of ESCOM on this channel some time ago, and I asked him, what is his view on the NGOs blocking a power station from going up, you know? And he said, well, to me, something which I think is, is, is almost what you said now. He said, if you know where you're going, you will not create laws that can be used against you. You know, and I, I think that is sort of very similar over here is that we have an idea maybe in a foreign policy, it's articulate, but then we have incompetent people. And then somewhere along with its ANC or government, a policy is made that seems to be 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And then it gets abused, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I don't want to make specific examples, but I mean, there are some things I've seen in the last couple of weeks, I just thought, holy crap. This is, can't be serious. That this is how how we are how we are running our relationships with some of the most important countries in the world, and it, it does very real damage. 
But I think even there, on, on that front, on foreign affairs, there's there too there's a realization sinking in that, um, you know, chickens come home to roost. And if you want to be a competitive society, you need to appoint the best people to the best positions, to the most important positions. So, so I, I would say that from from also that's the most important one, and and you say just to confirm again, you're optimistic that that is going well, to eventually I'm come out. I'm seeing a realize. I, I'd say ten years ago, if you suggested some of these things, you wouldn't get much of a hearing. You'd probably be dismissed. You'd be told everything's fine, nothing will go wrong. I mean, I, I you know, I, I can remember when. I actually sat. So it's long ago enough now. I sat in a meeting at Eskom. And someone presented the fact that the lights would go off. This might be 15 years back, maybe 10, 10, 12 years back. And I remember thinking this is the most important piece of strategic news. And just in, in the room and, and in the politics around there, um, I mean, a, a peripheral issue became the debate. I mean, this wasn't taken seriously. If, if you said then later in public, look, I think South Africa's going to run out of electricity, you weren't taken seriously. If, if you said you'd got to point, you, you can't expect anything else if you don't have the best people in their fields running something like that as comparistatal, you'd have been ignored at best and, and accused of, I don't know what, at, at worst. That the, the environment now is different, but you can make these points and you do get a hearing. The, the question is, does the ability exist? I think, I think there's an appreciation now of the need for this. There'd be an appreciation in, in government about the need to send competent people to be South Africa's ambassadors. Does the ANC sink and lose control of the country despite that knowledge because it didn't have the ability to take the action that it, it knows must be taken? Or, or does it surprise everyone and, and turn and save itself? I think the likelihood is that it, it does lose control of South Africa, it does fail. Well, the, the, the it knows exactly why. The, the other interpretation I would say is it might be that the people within the ANC that are more competent than others, and there are some, rise to the occasion. And it's within the ANC, you have more, you know, skilled people coming through the ranks. Maybe I, I don't know if, if that's no, they've also It's also applied to itself. You know, you must you must never believe your own propaganda. And the ANC believed its own propaganda and its own internal appointment processes suffer from the same flaws as what it did in the civil service. So does it have the ability to think its way out of this dilemma? Or has it actually checkmated itself? I think it's checkmated itself. If, if he, I don't like the fence-sitting analyst. So I'll tell you it's checkmated itself. It will lose control of the country. As it does so, its better people will understand exactly why it lost control. We then go to a new environment where South Africa is governed by coalitions. And there's a very good chance that at that coalition table is the ANC itself. I'm a proponent of this. I think a I think cutting the ANC out of a future coalition isn't the right thing to do. I think even though it's failing, it still represents millions of voters who deserve to be represented in government. And I think kicking the ANC too hard while it's down to the point of wishing to grind it into the dust and destroy it is a mistake that will set in motion cycles of future recrimination. Yeah. That future like, generation like, like with Russia, with the American state of Russia. You know, you don't do that. Yeah, I'd say crowd the ANC into a future coalition government. And I think opposition parties that campaign on the basis of destroying it completely, I think that's, I mean, and, and the, the ANC has a lot to answer for, um, undoubtedly. I just think it's strategically a mistake. And where, where this argument goes to then is 
The ANC loses because it can't turn. It finds itself in coalition, perhaps with South Africa's Democratic Alliance. That party is broadly pragmatic in most of its... In fact, there's not a lot of policy ground difference between the DA and the ANC's better people. No. And there's not a lot of policy difference between where the a DA is today and where the ANC was 10 years ago when it balanced the budget, created a surplus, cut debt levels in half, rolled out the largest social welfare program in the emerging world and doubled the number of people with employment while taking the economic growth rate to 5% in South Africa's share of global GDP was rising. So that ANC of 10 years ago, the DA of today, aren't on policy far apart. So if we get that line up in a future government, then I'd say on, on the balance of probabilities, um, the odds of South Africa outperforming beat the odds of South Africa, the failed state. Mm. And, and what do you make, sort of the last question we're going for landing, what do you make of the um, radical elements within our political sphere, the EFF being the obvious one of their recent um, quasi-genocidal singing, things of that sort? Do you think they're going to well, be a kingmakers or anything? Look, I think if you're a country where half of young people don't have a job, you you must expect that there will be a radical political influence. The the amazing thing about South Africa is that it's very small. You know, the 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 EFF struggles to break through ten percent of the vote. It's not because its marketing has failed. It's, people know that it's there. Or well, its policies aren't understood. They perfectly clearly understood. Um, and and the reason it doesn't win significant ground is is that the bulk of public opinion in South Africa is centrist and moderate. Now, will that remains the case now today? It's been the case for twenty years. Will it remain the case for another twenty years? I don't know, but I think it probably remains the case for the next five or six years. Well, I, I would argue that um, it won't remain the case because if I look at our median age, it's going up, and it's it's well known that radicalization. Those type of things will be more for the a youth that is wants to stand yeah, that's up. That's a very good point. Um, that that's a very good point. Um, so the the radicalism is is present as it must be. Yeah, but if if you want to have an optimistic assessment, what you read into the radicalization is actually the scale of the moderation and the opinions of ordinary people. There's absolutely nothing to stop anyone voting for and supporting that radicalization and bringing it to government. Yeah. But they don't do that. And the political history of the democratic era of the last 30 years is the opposite. The, the ANC, when it came to power in 94, had 63% of the vote. A decade later, it has balanced the budget. It hasn't nationalized the commanding heights of the economy. The white commercial farmers, that old sort of punching bag, is, are still farming on their farms. And the ANC support is up by six percentage points to 69. And the reason for that is that vast improvements in basic living standards matched with accelerated rates of urbanization were offering chiefly black South Africans, the chance at a Western-style uh, urban life. Compare that to the most recent 10 or 15 years of the ANC. It pursues an aggressive policy of expropriating property without compensation, threatens to nationalize health care, and does a few other things, a mad things. And the consequence is that its political support is 20 points below the peak that it was at when it was growing the economy. So the lesson from that is that in its radical phases, the ANC shed support very fast. In its centrist pragmatic, you might even call it its, 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 by standards of a lot of the Western media, by its right-wing phases, People get a lot happier and its support gets a lot stronger. Now, I, I, I reckon that 
trend will hold out for the next five or six years at least, meaning that if the ANC turns more radical in an attempt to outleft its left flank, it will lose support faster. If it returns to the centrist pragmatism that defined its first decade in power, which there were also big problems with, I mean, not, but, you know, on the scoreboard, there were real successes in, in jobs and growth and deficit. If it returns to that, it might just save itself. Um, uh, but but my, my call for you is it is too, it, it, has, it has wrecked its internal strategic capacity to too great an extent that even though it understands what must be done, it doesn't have the ability to do so. So we got a coalition in, in the next decade. Right. And if that's the kind of DAANC deal, the odds of an upside, um, a sort of reform swing for the country is stronger than the prospects of a downside state collapse. Okay. Well, that's, uh, I think we're going to leave it on that one. Thank you very much for this conversation and uh, oh, please cool. everyone Thank share and subscribe. Much. Very nice Appreciate to talk to you. Cool. Yeah. You go. Thank you. Cheers.